be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church in Coshocton, Ohio. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are so happy that you have come. May you experience God's love that is here for you. Happy birthday this week to Tom Albertson, Anne France, Emma Hunt, and John McPeak. Happy belated anniversary to Ryan and Camille McPeak, Chris and Karen Yost, Bill and Joellen Coble, and Randy and Cindy Wally. Are there any other birthdays or anniversaries coming up this week? Next Sunday is our church fellowship picnic at Lake Park. This will be two years since we've gathered for church fellowship. Um, I'm trying to get the language right. It is a hot dish, a pitch-in, a covered dish. Um, you bring your own food to share. How, how is that? Um, we will have hot dogs and drinks provided. I hope you can come next Sunday, 5 o'clock, at Lake Park. Today, we welcome Malik Kofani. He is our new choir director, part-time. This is his first day with us. He'll be playing a violin uh, solo for the offertory. Actually, he'll be playing with Mark. Malik, would you like to say a few words? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor, uh, Pastor Karen, for that warm welcome. I am extremely excited to be here. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Of course, my name is Malik Kalfani, but I just recently moved to Columbus because I'll be finishing my master's in orchestral conducting at The Ohio State University. Um, I got my undergrad from Cleveland State University where I graduated during COVID, when COVID first hit uh, two years ago with my degree in music education. Um, I'm an Ohio native, but not from the northeast side, I'm from the northwest side. So I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and then ventured over here for uh, both of my college degrees. So um, again, I'm very much excited to be working here today, uh, and I've, I've tried to touch base with a lot of you, and, and you guys are a fun group. I, it's going to be a very fun year. Um, and so on that note, I hope that you are looking forward to participating in the ensembles or, or, or listening to the ensembles. I hope to bring back the choir uh, after Labor Day, so that will be Wednesday, September 8th, I think is the date. So if you are interested in singing or rejoining the choir, uh, I invite you to do so on that date, and more information will be following soon. But again, I am I'm super blessed um, and excited to be here working with you all, and I look forward to the year to come. Jim Gill to speak to us about the trustees. Good morning. I want to give you an update on the trustees' request for several projects that are needed at the church. So far, we've received about half the funds we need for the projects. The ceiling of the parking lot will start in the next couple of weeks, and the painting and plaster repair here in the chapel and the stairwell uh, and the sanctuary will start in September. We still have other projects that we'll be working on uh, <clears throat> this fall. If you've given, we say thank you. If you're still praying and considering what you should do to help to complete the projects, remember any amount will help us achieve our goal. If you have any questions, please see any trustee. Again, thank you for your support. Let us worship our risen Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the opening sentence. God is the source of wisdom. The fount of life eternal. Let us listen for the wisdom of God. And worship the one whose words shape the world. Let us pray. Speak, God, for we, for we are your children. Are listening. If we need a gentle word, bring that. 
we need a strong one, bring that. Come, Holy Spirit, spark our imagination and stir our hearts. Give us wisdom. I'm sorry, I skipped a page. <laughs> I'll go back to the correct prayer. God, our living Father, we give you thanks for sending our Lord Jesus Christ to give his life as bread for the world. Fill us now with your spirit that we may make the most of the time understanding your will and expressing your wisdom in the midst of the people you have chosen. Amen. Thank you. 
other side of me. So you can kind of walk over my shoulder at this one. I'm going to be reading The Emperor's New Clothes by Hans Christian Andersen. Have you ever heard this story? The Emperor's New Clothes? Do you like to get new clothes? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the Emperor's going to get some new ones, but it's kind of a surprise. Come close so you can see. Many years ago, there lived an Emperor. He was so fond of new clothes that he spent all his time and all his money in order to be well dressed. He did not care about his soldiers, nor did he go to the theater or even ride out, except to show off his beautiful new clothes. He had a different suit for every hour of the day. People would ask, where is the emperor? Instead of answering he is in council with his ministers, his officers would reply, the emperor is changing his clothes in his dressing room. Good use of his time? Time passed merrily in the big town, which was the emperor's capital city. Visitors arrived every day at court, and one day there came two men who called themselves weavers, but they were in fact clever robbers. They pretended that they knew how to weave cloth of the most beautiful colors and magnificent patterns. Moreover, they said, the clothes woven from this magic cloth could not be seen by anyone who was unfit for the office he held or who was very stupid. The beautiful clothes could only be seen by those who were fit for the offices they held or who were very clever. These indeed must be splendid clothes, thought the emperor. If I had a suit made of this magic cloth, I could find out at once what men in my kingdom are not good enough for the positions they hold. And I should be able to tell who are wise and who are foolish. This stuff must be woven for me immediately. And he ordered large sums of money to be given to both the weavers in order that they might begin their work at once. So the two men who pretended to be weavers set up two looms and went on as though they were working very busily, though in reality, they did nothing at all. They asked for the most delicate silk and the purest gold thread. This they kept for themselves and put quietly into their knapsacks and then went on with their pretended work at the empty looms until far into the night. After some little time had passed, the emperor said to himself, hmm, I should like to know how the weavers are getting along with my cloth. I'm a little bit worried about going myself to look at the cloth because they said that a fool or a man unfit for his office would be unable to see the material. I'm sure that I am quite safe, but all the same, I think it best to some send someone else first. So he sends one of his ministers, his faithful old minister, to see how the weavers are going, how their work is going. The honest old minister went into the hall where the wicked men were working with all their might at the empty looms. What can be the meaning of this, thought the old man, opening his eyes very wide. I cannot see the least bit of thread on the looms nor the least bit of cloth woven. However, he did not speak his thoughts out loud. The men who were pretending to weave asked him very politely to be so good as to come here and then, pointing to the empty looms, asked him whether the design pleased him and whether the colors were not very beautiful. Were the colors beautiful? What do you think he's gonna say? Think he's going to be honest? Say he can't see it? You know this story. The poor old minister looked and looked, but he could not see anything on the looms for the very good reason that there was nothing there. But of course he did not know this and thought only that he must be a foolish man, unfit for the office of minister. Dear me, he said to himself, I must never tell anyone that I could not see that clock. 
So he goes on to pretend he sees it, compliments them on how beautiful it is, and then the emperor is pleased with a report brought by his minister, soon after sent another officer of his court to see how the men were getting on. How are the men getting on? What do you think? Do you see the beautiful cloth? There is no beautiful cloth. <laughs> It was, of course, just the same with the officer as had been with the minister. He looked at the looms on all sides, but could see nothing at all but the empty frames. Is he going to tell the truth? Is he going to say that he doesn't see it? What happens if he says he doesn't see it? Not fit for his office, that he's foolish. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I certainly am not stupid, thought the officer. It must be that I'm not fit for the very good, comfortable job I have. That's very odd indeed. However, no one shall ever know anything about it. So this continues. And the whole city is talking about the splendid cloth. Is there a splendid cloth? which the emperor had ordered to be woven at such great cost. And now at last the emperor wished to go himself and see the marvelous cloth while it was still on the loom. He took with him a few officers of the court, among whom were the officer and the minister, who had already seen the cloth and come back with tales of its beauty. As soon as the pretended weavers heard the emperor coming, they worked away harder than ever though they still did not weave a single thread through the empty blues. What's going to happen? Is the emperor going to admit that there's nothing there that he spent all that money on? You know. Is not the cloth magnificence of the officer and the minister who had already seen the weaver's pretended work? If your majesty would only be so good as to look at it, what a splendid design. What glorious colors! How is this, said the emperor to himself. I can see nothing. This is indeed terrible. Am I a stupid man? Or am I unfit to be emperor? That would be the worst thing that could happen. Oh, the cloth is beautiful, he cried out loud. I'm delighted with it. And he smiled most charmingly, for on no account would he say that he could not see what his officer and minister had praised so much. Okay, the story continues. Everyone complimenting them. The wicked man set up all night before the day on which the royal procession was to take place. He's going to wear these magnificent clothes. They had 16 lights burning so that everyone might see how eager they were to finish the emperor's new clothes. They continued to pretend. The suit is nearly ready, and now the emperor and all his court came to see the weavers work, and the rogues, robbers, deceivers, raised their arms as though they were holding up something beautiful to be seen. Here are your majesty's trousers. Here is the scarf. Here is the coat. The whole suit is as light as a cobweb. Well, at least that part was true. Can you see the suit? No, right? When dressed in it, one might fancy that no one have that one has on nothing at all. That, however, is the wonderful thing about this delicate magic cloth. Okay, so he gets dressed in the pretend clothes. You can't see him there. Why do you think you can't see him there? He's in the pretend clothes. What, what do you think he's wearing? Yes, he is not wearing anything at all. <laughs> the canopy which is to be carried over your majesty in the procession is waiting. So he's getting ready for the procession. I'm quite ready, answered the emperor. Do my clothes fit well? The lords of the bedchamber, who were to carry his majesty's train, felt about on the ground as if they were lifting up the ends and then pretended to be carrying something. 
They could never for a moment let anyone think that they were stupid or unfit for their job. And so the emperor walked under his high canopy in the middle of the procession. Look at this procession. And all the people standing by at those windows cried out, Oh, how beautiful are our emperor's new clothes. What a magnificent train. And how gracefully the scarf hangs. In fact, no one would admit that he could not see these clothes, which everyone seemed to think so beautiful, for fear he would be called a simpleton or unfit for his office. Never before had any of the emperor's clothes caused so much excitement as this. Look at him. How's he look? <laughs> How's he look? <laughs> But the emperor has nothing on at all, said a little child. One person, a little child. The child tells the truth, said the father. And so it was that the child, what the child said, was whispered from one to another until all knew. And they cried out all together, but he has nothing on at all. They listened to the child because they knew it was the truth. The emperor felt very silly, for he knew that the people were right, but he thought, the procession has started and it must go on. So the lords of the bedchamber held their heads higher than ever and took greater trouble to pretend to hold up the train, which wasn't there at all. Did that ending surprise you? So sometimes it's hard to tell who is the wise one in a group. Who was the wise one in the story? Do you know what I mean by wise? I do not. They were wise, the robbers. They were good, but they were, they were smart. But being wise means knowing the truth and being willing to tell the truth and also choosing to do the right thing. So with that new definition of wise, who was the only wise one in the story? Who told the truth? The little kid. The child. Yes, that was the wise one. Sometimes it's hard to be the wise one because it means disagreeing with everyone else. It can't mean that, being the wise one. And maybe people won't be your friend if you disagree. And that's really hard because we want people to like us. We want friends, but God always wants us to tell the truth in love and to choose to follow in the ways of God and the Bible and not try to be like everyone else. You two young men, don't try to be like everyone else, and your parents should be very proud of you. You're here in church every Sunday, and you're always helping us. You are a witness to all the other grown-ups and children for your faith. Will you pray with me now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your gift of wisdom to all who ask. Give us strength to not go along with the others who might be making foolish choices. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Will you forgive me? Guess what I forgot? Mm -hmm. I'll bring double next week, okay? <laughs> It'll be so much. Your parents will be like, whoa, stop. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. I love you.
but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep these words in your heart. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Thanks be to God. Our next scripture reading comes from 1 Kings, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and then um, chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have, grown, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself a long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. We're finishing week two, following Jim's knee surgery. Week two, raise your hand if you had knee surgery or a loved one had knee surgery. What happens at the end of week two? Does your personality change a little bit? <laughs> it does. These past two weeks have been nothing like any of the weeks we have experienced in our 16 year marriage. These two weeks have been different. <laughs> but I want you to know that Jim is doing
doing better. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your prayers and your cards, your words of encouragement. His pain is a little less, and he's getting around a little more. He's begun physical therapy at Three Rivers with Michelle. Isn't Michelle awesome? Do you know her, Three Rivers? She's awesome. I took him for the first time last Wednesday, and I asked, how long is this going to take? <laughs> first time we've been out in a long time. She said about 45 minutes. I asked, could you keep him about four hours so I can have my life back? They weren't interested in adult daycare. They said it was okay if I were a little late coming back from shopping at Bueller's. So I was. I filled up my car. That's one of the new things in my life with Jim. I'm doing all the driving and the shopping for now. Jim used to do all the shopping. And there was a good reason for this. When I go to the store, I'm distracted. Does that surprise you? <laughs> I'm distracted. I look at all around because I never go to the store. I never go anywhere. Church in heaven. I end up buying way more than what's on my list. But of course we need that. Of course we need ice cream. Yeah, of course we need that. And then I get home and I'm wondering, hmm, what should we have for dinner? <laughs> Did it ever happen to you? A cart full of food. Oh, nothing for dinner. Another thing I'm not used to doing is cooking for the family. There's a reason for that. It takes me forever. Jim plans ahead, shops for the ingredients, knows how to throw everything together quickly and have dinner ready on top and tasting delicious. <laughs> He also manages to wash all the dishes and have the kitchen clean every night before we go to bed. I often end up having pots soaking overnight in the sink while the dishwasher is running. Admit it, you do too, right? It's not perfectly clean at night, right? It's gonna be there in the morning. What's, what's the point, right? These last few weeks, we have had many decisions to make about Jim's care, about his rehab, about his PT, where to have it, how often to have it, when to start it, how we would set him up at home. We've never been through anything like this before. I didn't know we would need to rent a hospital bed. I didn't know anything about that. Thank God for Betty Jo at Freeze Medical Supply. Do you know who I'm talking about? We ended up moving our bedroom and my office downstairs in the basement so we could kind of live on one level of our split level. Yes, we have a split level. There's stairs everywhere. Everywhere you look, more stairs, even the front door. And no handrail either. <laughs> Jim would be able to use his walker and get to the only handicapped accessible bathroom. The other two are too small. House built in 1960. Theoretically, I wouldn't have to run up and down the stairs as much if we did this, had us all together in one room. The reality is I am running up and down the stairs all day and all night long. Up and down, up and down, up and down. My friend Sis, who's in her 90s, she's a retired uh, physical education teacher. She said, Karen, look on the bright side, you're getting great exercise. <laughs> That's true, I laughed. Now, if only I could get more consistent sleep, that would be good. I had a terrible dream a couple nights ago. Terrible dream. I woke up in a panic. You ever had that happen? Woke up in a panic. I dreamed that I came to church. Oops, sorry. I dreamed that I came to church and discovered it was Sunday morning. I was in my pajamas, <laughs> and I wasn't any way prepared for worship. Now you know a pastor's worst nightmare. I bet you're still dreaming about that math class when you show up and you have a test that you didn't know about and you didn't study for. <laughs> Anyone in here have those kind of dreams? Yeah, what do you need a test on calculus? What? How <laughs> 
that's when I realized that my prayer needed to be more than Lord help us and Lord heal Jeff. It also needs to be Lord give us wisdom for all these decisions. God is in your will every moment of every day. Help us, help us to be faithful, to walk in your ways. Solomon is our example of the one king of Israel who knew his limitations and how much he needed the Lord to be able to live out his call to be king. He had a dream encounter with God when he was worshiping him, offering sacrifices in the high place at Gideon. This was at the beginning of his reign. God asked him what he should give him. Young Solomon answered humbly and eloquently, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness in righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son, he's talking about himself, to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of your servant, my father David. Although I am only a little child, this picture shows him young. I do not know how to go out or come in. Solomon is all of 15. When his father dies or slept with his ancestors, as the Hebrew Bible so poetically describes death, he slept with his ancestors. He knew he had big shoes to fill, big shoes. His father David was 30 when he was anointed king. Acts 13, 22 says that God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. David led his army to conquer Jerusalem. He made it the capital. Having the Ark of the Covenant brought there, he made it the center of worship for the Israelites. That was David. David was a musician. You knew that about him, right? And is considered the author of many of the songs in ancient Israel's hymnal, the Art Book of Psalms. Though David was a sinful man, committing adultery with Bathsheba, and then having her husband Uriah killed, to cover up his sin and be with her, he would become the most beloved king of all Israel, of all Israel's history. He reigned 40 years over a united monarchy of Israel and Judah. His son Solomon would go on to do great things, reigning from 970 BCE to 931 BCE, almost a thousand years before Christ. Beginning in the fourth year of his reign, he used some of the enormous wealth that he and his father had accumulated to build the first temple of Israel, of Jerusalem. Solomon is traditionally considered the author of, do you know the, the biblical books that he wrote? Proverbs, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs. But that day when Solomon was offering sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of his people and worrying about how on earth he would ever be king of Israel. He had only one request of the Lord. Wisdom. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, this is wisdom, to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this your great people. God is pleased with Solomon's request of God, as God would be pleased if we asked for the same. The Lord blesses him with more than he has asked for, more than he expected. Solomon will have great wealth, 
and a long life. What Solomon, Solomon is best known for is his wisdom, the gift of a wise and discerning mind to lead God's people. One famous example of Solomon's wisdom, now there was artwork of this, and then I thought, no, I can't show you this, is when two women came claiming to be mother of the same child. Okay, do you remember this story? Solomon resolves the dispute by commanding the child be cut in two. There's all kinds of artwork of this. One woman quickly renounces her claim, proving that she would rather give up the child than see it killed. Solomon declares, the woman who showed compassion to be the true mother, entitled to the whole child. Our readings in 1 King and Ephesians today remind us that now is the time to live as wise people, not foolishly wasting these days that God has given us. Let us prepare for the Lord's return by seeking the source of wisdom. Listen to this promise in James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, you are good enough to ask for wisdom, and it will be given to you. What a promise. Don't know which way, don't know how to do something, don't know where to go, don't know what to do, ask. God will give you wisdom. But what is wisdom? It's not being smart enough to know all the answers to the questions on, or actually all the questions to the answers on Jeopardy. That, that makes sense sometimes. Wisdom isn't something, wisdom isn't trivia, and it's not knowledge at all which puffs up. And the wisdom of this world isn't the same as the wisdom of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 19 and 20, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Sounds like those robbers in the story we read. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. The wisest thing that young Solomon ever did was admit to God that he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a clue. And that his calling to rule over Israel was something he couldn't do on his own. He certainly hadn't earned this calling from his own merit or good works, just as we don't earn our callings from our good works. The starting place for wisdom, then, is knowing, loving, and trusting the Lord, and knowing ourselves and being honest with ourselves about ourselves. There is a wisdom in knowing our limits. You know your limits? I know a lot of my limits. Maybe not all. There is wisdom in knowing our potential because nothing is impossible with God. Say that with me. Nothing is impossible with God. And we are God's beloved. Most of all, there is wisdom in knowing God is with us. We are with each other. We are not alone. With the gift of wisdom comes responsibility for faithfulness. You have the power to be faithful. Be faithful. Do you want to be pleasing to God as Solomon was? Seek to do God's will every day. Be faithful. And when you leave this place today, go. Walking in the wisdom of the God who lights the path before us. Go blessed by the God who journeys with us. The God who wants us to ask of him like Solomon, give me a wise and discerning mind. Will you pray with me? Let us pray. Dear Lord, sometimes we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to ask for. We feel overwhelmed in some of the seasons of our lives. But we always know that we need you, we love you, we trust you. 
We want to be pleasing to you like Solomon was. Lord, give us a wise and discerning mind. Grant us wisdom for the many decisions that we are facing as individuals and as your church, the body of Christ. Heal the sick, bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted. Provide for those in need, body, mind, and spirit. And guide us in your will every moment of every day. Help us to be faithful to walk in your ways. In our triune God we pray. Setback for her. 
Um, she is not ready for visitors yet. She wanted you to know that. And don't take it personal. It's just that she feels so bad right now. Uh, but she would receive your cards if you sent them to her home address because her family is getting her mail and they are visiting her every day. Will you pray for our elderly neighbors at Windsor Wood? We were supposed to have our Windsor Wood worship service today. It was canceled because Windsor Wood is closed. All the residents are on quarantine because there are more than 10 cases of COVID in Windsor Wood. The residents who were vaccinated became ill when the virus was brought in. I want you to know that none of our church members, Velma Hoffman, Margaret McDowell, and Jane Coble, none of them at this point have COVID. And they are on lockdown. They're not allowed to leave their rooms or even associate with each other. How difficult that must be, especially for Velma, who's 99. I mean, she just feels so, so isolated. Let us pray for their protection from the illness and the healing of those who are sick. Mary Smith went home to be with the Lord on August 12th. She was our longest living member. Didn't know this about her. She joined the church on October 6, 1940. She was ordained a deacon in 2004. Chuck Snyder will be leading the funeral at Given Dawson Paisley on August 25th at 1 o'clock. There will be a reception here at the church afterward around 2.30ish in the, in the downstairs fellowship hall. I invite you to pray for her family, especially her three kids, Julie, Joseph, and John. Are there other prayer requests? Yes. I would like to pray for the Presbyterian Church. You would like to pray for the Presbyterian Church. Thank you. We definitely need your prayers. <laughs> Others, requests, or updates on our folks? Then I invite you to join with me in the prayers of the people. Let us pray. In our trouble and need, we look to the Lord the giver of our daily bread, saying, God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. Help us to discern the mind of Christ so that we may abide in your word and walk in your ways each day. God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. Show your mercy and grace to the nations, feeding the hungry, redeeming the captives, and establishing justice for all people. God of abundance grace, hear our prayer. We pray for this community. Let your wisdom dwell among us, so that we may lay aside foolish ways and return to your path of righteousness. God of abundant grace, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for loved ones. Pour out your blessing, O Lord, on all those who are suffering. Give them long lives to enjoy your goodness. God of abundant grace, hear our prayer. Generous God, as you provide for us each day, nourish and strengthen us in faith and faithfulness, so that we may share your grace in a hungry world. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of life, Hear us now. We pray with one voice as you have taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And we us not but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give both because we have much to be grateful to God for and because the giving itself molds us into generous people. 
It teaches us a path of wisdom, marked not by risk management, but by overflowing grace. I invite you to bring forth your tithes and honor.
blessings to these gifts, God, that they may multiply in ways far beyond us, establishing your kingdom of peace and plenty. Thank you. 